Um, something awesome. As I said, uh, God, uh, the church, biblically, are the called out ones. They're, they're the called out ones. And I always learn from my senior pastors that wherever the church is called out of something, it usually means they're all actually called into something. So the church always has moving, it's an organism. We are an organism. I don't mean church, if you're here first time, I don't mean building, I mean people. And so the church is this living organism that's always sending, and new people are coming, and new people are going. Well, that happens on the staff level. And for the last two and a half years, um, I have had a wonderful assistant in John Gaunt. Some of you know John, some of you don't know John. But John's the guy behind the scenes that allows me to function in this office that makes sure everything's running and happening. Well, over the last few months, God has put a calling on John's life to go and actually be a pastor in training at the Hollywood campus under Greg Howard. So, John probably got another month here, um, and you can start making your way up here. Um, he's probably got another month here, and so um, here's what I said. He's been faithfully teaching our on-campus uh, FAU gathering on Tuesday nights, very faithfully, yeah. And, um, and I said, John, you know, you got a few more weeks here. I think you've deserved the opportunity to speak to the people that you've ministered to behind the scenes for a couple of years. And, um, you know, I want to say this publicly. Um, there is nothing more... Um, every pastor who leads something needs a Joshua to support the vision that they're trying to cast. And when you get a man to come alongside you to, to not only be a steward of that vision, but actually see that vision come to fruition is a very, very rare thing in the ministry. It's a lot harder to be a man behind the scenes than a man in front of the scenes. And this guy's done it very, very well. And he's done it exemplary. And so I just thought, it's your opportunity. You've been so faithful. You've been, a, and it's not like you're going to die. Uh, <laughs> and I know your wonderful bride is here somewhere. There's Kate. Every, behind every good man, there's a great woman. So Kate's here. Round of applause for Kate, everyone. Um, but I just wanted to publicly say you've been so good to this ministry, and I'm excited about what Greg gets in Hollywood and what God is going to do there, and I'm excited about your Bible study. Wow. So uh, if you would, give a warm icon welcome to John Gaunt. Yeah, you got it. Amazing man, Pastor Billy, huh? Let's give a thank you to Pastor Billy for this amazing ministry. Well, guys, I'm excited to spend time in the Word with you. Honored to be here and honored to serve with you guys and worship Jesus with you. If you would, open your Bibles to Matthew 4, verse 18. Matthew 4, 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Father, come to you in Jesus' name, and Lord, thank you so much for your word, and thank you that if, if the night ends tonight, we've done all we need to do is, is be in your word because that's where the power is. Father, your, your sword that can divide spirit from flesh and bone from marrow, and Lord, the power that's in it. Thank you, Lord, that you've given it to us and that you've given us that love letter to show us who you are and reveal yourself to us on earth. Lord, we ask that it pierces every heart tonight as this section has so pierced mine and that it speaks into and, and exhorts and sends out the way it has to me. Father, we're so grateful for this time and just ask that you bless it, that your spirit speaks, that you eliminate distractions uh, from anything that we can just be in your word. Love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Now, I chose Matthew 4.18 because it's one, of my, it's one of my favorite sections because, well, I'm a fisherman. I, I can relate to at least what they were doing. I can relate to fishing. I actually, for a short amount of time, I worked on a commercial fishing boat. And I, I know what goes in to making a lifestyle out of fishing. But I also, uh, we didn't do the net thing on the commercial fishing boat. It was more lines for, for kingfish. But I, I also do a little fishing on my own pretty often. Um, any of you guys fishermen? Any girls fishermen in here? All right. So many girls are like, for real, a fish story? Is that what, Billy, you invited a, a fish story guy? So anyways, no, I, it's, it's, a very, it's a very cool thing, fishing, and those of you who fish, you know there's a, a great amount of patience involved and faith involved. You don't know what you're going to get. And strategy, I mean, you actually have, if you're a skilled fisherman and you know the species you're going for, you have a specific strategy and you actually study, hey, what are they biting and what season are they biting, what time are they biting, what, and, and you spend your whole day around when the fish are showing up and when they're gone and, and the, the other, on both sides of that day, you're, you're getting lures ready, you're getting your, your study done, you're getting whatever needs to be done to be able to get that species of fish and do it well, right? So some of you are like, dude, fish and worm, whatever, you know. Um, no, but for real, any, any snook fishermen? Yeah. All right. That's the skilled guy right there. Okay, so again, you're saying I hate fishing and I can't identify with you. Where's this going? Well, maybe you're into fashion, Maybe you're into clothes. Maybe you spent a long time getting your hair ready when you came here, and perfect. You are also a fisherman, just a different kind. <laughs> you're and maybe not fishing for men the way Jesus intended, but let alone you're fishing. So these guys were using nets. They spent all day preparing their nets. They, they got their nets ready in the morning. All they fished with was their nets. And at night when they were, I'm sorry, in the morning when they came in from the night fishing, that morning they were stretching their nets, washing their nets, preparing their nets because if they didn't take care of them and spend all that time on them, within weeks they would be destroyed. I mean, if you don't stretch the nets and get them ready for the next day, they could crack and break. And there's also, I mean, depending on what they casted it onto, there's, there's rips in it, there's tears, there's, I don't know if you guys have ever cast a cast net, but there's some skill involved just in that alone. It's sort of this, you know, it actually looks like somebody, something Jesus would do when he's teaching, you know? But anyways, um, I, I've been so frustrated with cast nets. And one, they cost a lot of money. And two, they get caught on everything. And you don't, you very seldom catch only what you're casting for. You get jellyfish, you get these prickly things that, that sting you, you get, get caught on rock bottom if you don't pull it perfectly in time and, and ruin your nets. Um, you have to, your, your whole mindset is around doing the nets well. So again, I mentioned the fashion thing. I mentioned the, uh, you know, that you might be a different kind of fisherman. Um, but the reason I'm pointing that out is because they were fishermen. That was their identity. If you look in verse 18, it says, for they were fishermen. You know, underline that. That was their identity. And their strategy was they used the nets. The nets was what brought in their livelihood. The nets, their, their, their identity was fishermen. Their, their strategy was using the nets. So what's your identity? I mean, these guys, it says they were fishermen. What's your identity? Who are you? You know, something to think about. I know who I am now, but I'll tell you who I was. May 2013, just a few years ago, I was sitting in jail with a charge that was accurate for manufacturing hallucinogenic drugs. So, you know, the Lord can do a lot, amen? But I'm going to Tarantino that a little bit. So that's where I was. Let me show you how I got there. Um, my, my identity, my identity back then was I wanted to be the life of the party. I wanted to get the girl. That was, that was my goal. I wanted to have all the friends. I wanted to be the reason the party happened and the reason the party was good. 
I wanted to be recognized, and for me, that was how I felt worthy, that's how I got my worth, and that's how I felt loved. That's how I got my love. So I spent my life and my whole, my, my whole waking moments to, to fulfill and catch what I needed to get that, to keep that identity strong. So whether it be alcohol, whether it be drugs, whether it be, uh, you know, just smooth talking and lying, those were, those were my, that was my strategy. That was my net. I used that to bring in those things I wanted to support my livelihood and my identity. So my strategy was my net, the, the parties and, and having big ones for, for that matter. So uh, I was a swimmer. I was a, a college swimmer, a college athlete, and I was swimming at FAU. And even during swimming, I mean, all you have time to do is think. I was thinking about the next party. I was thinking about in between during those sets, and we'd come to the wall, and the guys would be like, dude, yeah, we're going to do it at this house. You got the liquor. You got the weed. All right, we're ready to go. You know, you guys know what I'm talking Don't look at me like I'm a sinner. <laughs> okay. Not everyone in here was spanked coming out saying Jesus and praising the Lord, right? <laughs> All right, so, so I, I spent my whole day and my whole week planning my livelihood. My mind was always on my strategy to support my identity, which was that life of the party. I worked on the next high. I set up the next party all day, all week. Um, actually, I took a job at a liquor store. Pretty funny, pretty funny story. Um, and not funny, but I, I, I took a job at a liquor store because I needed a job, I needed some money, I had some habits that I wanted to support. Um, eating was one of them, come on. But, so, I, I, I had this Russian boss, and his name was Rich. Perfect for the, stra uh, for the illustration, but um, Rich had this strong Russian accent, and when I was working for him, he, he loved me, he treated me like a son, um, but there was one thing, when, uh, when a black guy came into the store, he'd be like, John, I want you to follow this guy. They steal from me. Those guys steal from me. It's always the black men. They always steal the, the liquor. I want you to always keep your eye on them, and I want to make sure that you know that they know they're being watched. And that always struck a string with me. I had, I had many black friends, I, but his racism really bothered me. And I would follow the guys around obediently and be like, hey, man, what's going on? And they're like, you know, like, what do you like to drink? Me too. You know, yeah, Hennessy. Like, I, I felt like, I, I felt like an idiot. And I was so, I'd walk back and he'd say, good job, John, you know, he did not steal because you watched him. That's why he didn't. And I'm thinking, man, and I had been stocking the liquor there for a while. And I had already thought, man, this would be really easy just to take it out from under this guy's nose. And it was really tempting, but I had no justification. Now, now I had justification. Oh, you think he's stealing. You think that it's the black people that steal from you, buddy. All right, well, here we go. Let me do that so that you can continue to blame them, and we're good, because you would never suspect the guy who's making sure they don't, right? So I would stack, you know, I would, I would stock the liquor. I had boxes of, of six handles. The, they came in, you know, you know what a handle is? If you don't, don't worry, big amount. So I, I would, you know, carry out Jack Daniels, uh, six handles of it. I would stock five. I would text my friends, say, what do you want? You know, I've got five openings. And they would, you know, text me the liquors they wanted. I'd put the handles of those liquors back in the box. Going out to the garbage, Rich, and would take it out, leave it by the garbage, and my friends would zip by. And, um, you know, they would pick the liquor up and the party would be ready, you know, life of the party, the provider, I mean, hey man, you guys need me. It was perfect, and I had the justification. That guy thought the hood was Robin, and I got to be Robin Hood. <laughs> I, no, for real, I, I, got, I got to steal from the rich, literally, and give to the poor, college students. So, now, the sad thing is he really trusted me. The sad thing is that he loved me. And it's funny because Satan will always find a way to justify sin. He will always find, we will always be, and we want it. We want the justification. I want a reason that I can do what I know is wrong. And as soon as we find it, we jump on it. And, this, it, and it's not only for you being bad, 
Satan uses it because he wants to destroy somebody else. Let alone was he destroying the people I was taking the liquor back to, and there's girls and guys getting smashed, giving away their virginity because I was the one who provided the liquor that made him give wrong, make wrong decisions, let alone I was one of those guys participating in that. The guy, Rich, his heart was broken because the guy, the guy he trusted, the guy who's sort of like treating like a son was, was you know, who I was. I mean, he didn't know that, but I, I just kind of quit one day because I knew eventually he's going to find, I mean, he kept going, more and more liquor is going, and I know it's the blacks, and I'm thinking, man, and I even justified his racism because I can't go tell him, no, it was me. So I justified his racism, I broke his heart, I ruined lives. Satan is so clever, huh? And so it got worse. My, my nets were being destroyed by what they were catching. My nets of wanting those things I used to be the life of the party were destroying me, destroying others. That drugs, the alcohol, it, was, it turned into strong sexual addic- addictions to, to women, to pornography, to even prostitution. Even, it didn't matter if I was dating somebody or not. It, it's just however I could immediately get satisfied as fast as I could, whether it be the next high, the next girl, the next experience. Um, and it got worse and worse. And the funny thing is, is I became netted and tangled by my own net. And I, and I was pulled, I was pulled further, further into, as I tried to repair where I realized my net was breaking, I got caught in it and got pulled down. In that, I made, I made a couple grabs for Jesus. Jesus, forgive me, help me out, get me out of here. Um, but each one of those grabs didn't seem to offer the high that I got from weed, from coke, from LSD, from, from, or uh, that sex gave me. I, I wasn't getting that same feeling or experience, and I was looking for a feeling when I gave my life to Jesus. So I actually, long story short, very long story, very short, I was working at, I was working at the beach as a lifeguard at this point, and um, I'm now a dealer. I'm now, I'm now growing marijuana and growing psychedelic mushrooms, and I, my habit had become my, my stronghold. And I'm stuck in all of this. I'm no longer, if you guys saw Pineapple Express, I'm the guy who's like, come on, please stay and hang out. Like, nobody would. Like, the life of the party went to the deadbeat that was just, you know, the way to get drugs, and that was it. They wouldn't hang out. They wouldn't spend time. I'm in my tower, and I started bringing my Bible with me again because I was just like, man, there's got to be, I need Jesus or something. And I had just finished denying Jesus to a friend. I had finished, I had this Jesus fish tattoo on me, um, and I got it, you know, not prayerfully. I got it when I was wasted on 4th of July. So, and I was like, maybe if I get a tattoo, I won't get as drunk. You know, I'll see it's Jesus. And it didn't work. I became a dealer, actually. So, um, but, so the guy saw the tattoo. I was like, dude, I'm just covered up with a sweet rose. You know, Jesus, uh, blah, blah, blah. My dad's a Buddhist Roshi, the, you know, which is true. Um, but I'm going to get a tattoo of a Buddha on this side, tattoo of Jesus on this side. They're going to be cracking up. And in the middle, it's going to say, they don't get it yet. You know, I was so cynical, and I was so worldly, and I, I knew that Jesus was real because of my mom and my stepdad, but I straight up denied him, and somehow the Holy Spirit just went, and as the guy left, like as I convinced him that Christianity was stupid, the Spirit just came heavy on me, this conviction, and it was just, I love you. Why did you do that? Because I love him too. And I got on my knees, and I'm praying in the tower, Lord, my life is a wreck. I'm I'm dying. And if you need to do anything to get me out of this lifestyle, I was actually at that point, I'm also in debt to a drug dealer uh, because I said somebody stole everything. What I really did is I spent it and smoked it all. And, and I, was, I was in debt to this guy. And basically, he had the power to take my life, or at least the guys he knew did. And so I'm freaked out. I, I realized that I need to run back to Jesus real fast. Another one of those, okay, give it back to Jesus times. And I pray in the lifeguard tower, Lord, if you need to do anything to get me out of this lifestyle, just get me out of it so I know it's you. Lord, if you are real, if I need to be fired from this job, if I need to be evicted from my uh, house that I'm living in, if I need to be put in jail, only like a night or something, but if you need to wake me up, like, (laughs) if you need to put me in jail, put me in jail. Two weeks later, I tell you the truth, I'm fired, evicted, in jail. Careful how you pray. 
So, so at that point, it was a very long road to giving my life fully back to Jesus, but it was like the third night that uh, I asked for one. That was where he didn't answer at that. But it was third, third night I said, you know, Lord, okay, I'm yours. And I didn't know what that meant at all. I, I, I had so many strongholds that I, I mean, I was planning on smoking a joint as soon as I got out with my girlfriend. And like, there was just so much that was going on. But my identity had wrecked my life. My identity perished. Where's, where's your identity? Where's your strategy? What, is, it, is it money? Is it, if I have enough money, people will like me. Or if I have enough money, I can enjoy myself. And I'm going to use certain means to get to that, which is my net for that. Is it love? Is it, man, I just, I, I just want to be loved. And I'll do whatever I can do to feel loved, regardless of what it is. Is it, is it excitement? Your, your identity is just, I just want to have fun all the time. I don't care what it is. Let's do the wildest thing. And I'll do whatever it takes to get there. Any temporary fulfillment, I mean, that's, that's us, that's our fleshly syndrome, is whatever will fulfill and whatever we can see that's, that we know will feel good or be fun or be exciting or be diverting, we go for it. We're, and we're, we're makers of ourself. We, we naturally want to make ourself something. And without Jesus, that's all we got. We got us, man. We're in it for ourselves. Every man for himself, right? So you got to make it happen. But remember, the thought that none of us like to think is you're going to fade, that life ends at some point, whether it be because of a stupid choice or whether it be just because of gravity and time. Um, we're makers of ourself, and it's going to fade. It's all temporary, right? All these things were temporary, and all those things go away. I mean, as soon as, as, soon as you got that one high, as soon as it was gone, you need the next one. I mean, I know especially when it got into cocaine and, and other things like opium and all that, for me, it was, as soon as I had it, dude, as soon as it was done, I needed more. And the, the fishermen, the fish they caught, same thing, kind of. Fish were perishable. Fish worked for one meal. You know, you ate a fish, it's done, you got to eat another one. And if you didn't eat it fast enough, it's, it's done, you got to go get another one. So these fishermen are fishing for temporary things. So look at 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. Jesus comes along and he wants to make them fishers of men, have them make eternal catches, not temporary catches anymore. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. Do you know that those who run in a race all run? But one who receives the prize, run in such a way that you may obtain it. And anyone who comp uh, competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. They do it to obtain a perishable crown. We're after a perishable crown. It's going to be done. It's not going to be remembered. It's going to be pointless. And here's the new strategy. Ready? But we, for an imperishable crown... Matthew, back to Matthew 4, verse 19, he says, then he says to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Now, here's our new identity. Here's the new identity that Jesus Christ offers. You're no longer a fisherman. You no longer fish for fish. You're going to fish for men. A pretty neat thing. We're no longer fishing for perishable, but we're fishing for imperishable. Follow me. That word follow me, it, it, it follow is to come after. The word follow means to imitate or to become like. So he's not just saying walk where I walk. He's saying become like me. Imitate me. Follow me. Jesus is saying you are no longer a fisherman. You are a Christian. You are a disciple. And the cool thing about that is we're his disciples and we get eternity if you are a believer in Jesus. His, his word, John 1, 1, in the very beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. And we see down in John 1, verse 14, it says, and the word became flesh. This eternal word of God came to reveal himself to us. And the thing that created the universe came down in the shape of man 
to call us to say, come follow me. I want to make, I want to give you eternal purpose. I want to give you imperishable purpose. We're his disciples. We get eternity for whosoever believes in him. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. My identity is no longer in myself and what I make it. My identity is no longer life of the party. My identity is in Jesus Christ. And our strategy, our new strategy, follow me and I will make you. Follow me and I will make you. I will make you, Jesus says. By, how does he do that? By his Holy Spirit. When you believe in Jesus Christ, he comes and indwells you. And, what, and, and he, it says that the Spirit reminds us of the things that Jesus did and taught. And he guides us, he leads us, he comforts us, he empowers us. Who knows what language that the Holy Spirit speaks? You guys know what language? I mean, because if you don't know what language he speaks, how do you know what he's asking you to do? How do you know where he's leading you? How do you know how he's making you? He speaks the word of God. He reminds us of the things that Jesus did and taught. The Holy Spirit speaks the word of God, so how do we know Holy Spirit's language? We have to read it. This is how he speaks to us. The, the Bible says that how can a young man cleanse his way in Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. It says later, your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. This, the Holy Spirit's language is what changes our lives. The word of God is what just completely transforms us. And Jesus is the one who made the payment that we have the chance at transformation. So his word changed me. He, he led me into, out of that saying, okay, Lord, I'll follow you. I don't even know what that means right now. But he led me into these godly relationships with men that were saying, no, 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 not there. Just come with us. Don't go there anymore. Don't hang out with them anymore. Come, come with us. Come read this. Come to Icon. Come to, I, I, I remember my first night at Icon, and my, my buddies were like, let's go, let's go. And I'm like, I got, I got, I got to go get prayer. And I sat down with Pastor Billy. I don't know if Pastor Billy remembers this. But I just start bawling. And I'm emotional. I'm an emotional guy. But I'm just telling him what I've never told anybody. Nobody knew, nobody knew that I went to see prostitutes. I mean, yeah, it was kind of cool. that I would have been with a lot of girls. But if I told him what type of girls, what would he think of me? And just I'm saying this, and this guy is just loving me and just receiving it. And I don't know if he's going, oh, great. This guy's a wolf. You know, like... <laughs> But, I mean, he just, he took me in, and his, his advice was memorize scripture. Just get three by five cards and start memorizing scripture. I'll hold you accountable. You start memorizing scripture. And then another man came into my life, said, John, you're going to memorize scripture. My, those buddies started memorizing scripture with me. They already were, but they did it even more so to hold me accountable and sh- so we could sharpen each other. The word of God was changing my life. I was, I was giving over stronghold after stronghold. It took a while. It took a while. It didn't have to take a while, but because I didn't know what Jesus meant by drop your nets immediately, I thought it meant string by string, you know, and I just slowly was untying it going here, here. (laughs) You know, it it was very slow. So the cool thing is 2 Corinthians 3.18, the icon verse, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, but we all with unveiled face Beholding is is in a mirror, this word is the mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So it is a process from glory to glory. It's by the Spirit of the Lord that that process happens as we look into the mirror for our lives. So we, we have this mirror, we have this mirror that reflects Jesus Christ. And we can become more and more like it because the Spirit of God makes us. Come follow me and I will make you. Come imitate me and I'll make you. I will turn you into my image as we follow. So our identity was self. Our our strategy was maker of ourselves. And our identity has now become disciple. And our strategy, he will make us. Very cool. Make what? What is he going to make us? Well, he says... I will make you fishers of men. I will make you disciple makers. If you're going to be in my image, you're going to do what I do. I make disciples. 
So that's what you have been redeemed to do, is to also redeem. Amen? So Matthew 28, one of Jesus' greatest commands to us, the Great Commission, verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So, Jesus' command to us is go make disciples. It wasn't only for the disciples, but if you are a disciple, it is for you. Now, that might have been confusing. But disciple making is what we've been made to do. If we're to become like Jesus, he makes disciples, we make disciples, right? That's where the excitement is. The excitement is you were, and this is, this is Garrett Beeler put it really well. He said, the, the fishermen, fishermen bring life to death. They pull, they, pull de- they pull live fish out of the water to kill it, essentially. But a fisher of men pulls dead men out to make them alive. It's way exciting, guys. Have you ever seen a non-believer come into believing of Jesus Christ and following Jesus? Have you ever seen that it's just like death to life? And you were, it happened to you. Some of you in this room, many of you in this room have experienced that, man, a major change has happened. And if you haven't, are you trying to become like him? Are you making disciples? Because that's, that's what we're called to do. The, the Bible uses the term in the New Testament, the word disciple in the Greek shows up 269 times, the word disciple. The word Christian shows up three times. So the word Christian shows up three times, but it's still referring to the disciples. Now we have this term, I don't know if you've heard it, where somebody goes, yeah, he's a Christian, they're a Christian. Well, are they a believer or are they like a disciple? You guys heard that? Are they a believer or are they like a disciple? The Bible doesn't give any permission to just be a believer. A believer is a disciple. If you believe in Jesus Christ and what he said, it should cause you to become like Jesus Christ. He will, he will make us fishers of men, but it requires us walking. He can't, it's not like, once you give your life to me, you become a robot. All right, Jesus, I love you, God. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not like that. It's still a free will process all the way through for eternity. It's a free will process. But as you, as you obey him, you fall in love with him. Jesus said, if you obey me, you'll love my, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. But the man who says he obeys me but doesn't love me is a liar and the truth isn't in him. So obeying him, he said, go make disciples. We go make disciples. Um, and the thing is, is, is disciple making, if you're a Christian, it begins immediately. Well, I haven't done seminary. I haven't even, I haven't been discipled yet. I mean, all I have is this, I mean, I, 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 Really, right now, this is the first time I've even been. How do, I make, how do I make disciples if I'm not a disciple? Well, I'll tell you, John chapter 9, you don't have to go there, but Jesus heals a blind man. First encounter with Jesus. Jesus tells him to go wash his eyes in the pool of Bethsaida. He comes back. He's, he can see. And everybody, the Pharisees, everybody's going, what happened, what happened, what happened? And he, and he says, all I know is this, I was blind and now I see. The dude's evangelizing from, like, the first things he says. He's making disciples right away. He does, he's, he's using the information he has. I was blind and now I see. You can say, dude, I, I don't know, I went to Icon and I heard some cool Bible and changed my life. You just come. <laughs> that's, that's disciple making. You can always take somebody to the step that you've taken, right? So... Another example, um, he may be in here, and I'm going to embarrass him, Uh, Caleb Escalani. This guy got, I mean, don't feel too big, Caleb. This guy's a (laughs) dirtbag. He was a dirtbag. And he gets saved. Jesus does a work in his life, and immediately, he doesn't have seminary, but he's going to the gym now, and he's saying, Jesus, my life is yours now. People are getting saved in the gym. Some of those guys might even be here tonight that have given their life to Jesus Christ just because he was sharing what Jesus was doing in their life. The guy spits fire for Jesus Christ now, and he's been, he's been walking for months, and people are getting saved left and right. That same power is inside of each and every one of you who believes. 
to make disciples. And that's where the excitement is. He comes, he's so joyful, he's so stoked, and he's ripped too, so it makes it intimidating. But, <laughs> like, now you guys are, like, looking at him if you know him. But, I don't know where he is. But, um, <laughs> I just I threw myself off by saying that. Um, God does a work in you, and your you, disciple-making be- starts immediately. And, guys, all you got to do is walk into where the Lord's leading you. You just walk. Holy Spirit says, I'll do the talking. Jesus says, you just walk, I'll do the talking. You just need to obey and show up where I've asked you to, and I will use your mouth. I'll teach you. I'll, the Bible says, don't worry about what you're going to say. The Spirit will tell you what to say when it's time. Now, we are to be reading the Word, and the Word will just kind of come out of you if the Word's what you're putting into you. But if the world is what you're putting into you, the world is going to come out of you. And it's just the difference of an L, if you think about it. You either got the word, or you got an L in there, and it's the world, so that would make you a loser. (laughs) I just thought of that. I just thought of that. I like that. So he will build you. He will build you. He's going to be the one who does the work. The strategy is the Holy Spirit will make you the man or the woman in Christ that you were always meant to be. Philippians 1 verse 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He'll complete the work. He started the work. He'll end the work. He was the one who even led you to make the decision. He was the one who started the whole thing in the first place, who said, hey, I love you. Why don't you follow me? And you were, we were like, okay, nothing else is working. Or maybe it was working, which is even more dangerous. Matthew 4, verse 20. Let's actually go back to 18. And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Verse 20, they immediately left their nets and followed him. They immediately left their nets and they followed him. Jesus is saying, follow me, don't follow man. They, immediately they followed him. They dropped everything and immediately followed Jesus. Now, one example of that it's, it's not a good thing to, to follow men um, I, I had, I, I'm not going to name her, and I'm not going to tell you where it happened. Um, I was thinking about doing an accent, but that would be weird, you know, just to throw you off. But this, this girl that I had been spending a lot of time around in the area that I was at the time, um, she comes up to me and she goes, I have something I have to tell you. I was like, all right, you know. I mean, I didn't know why we were emotional at the moment, and, and this blew me out of the water. She goes... Jesus told me that you're my husband. And so, (laughs) it wasn't Kate. That wasn't Kate that told me that. So, by the way, Kate's awesome. That's my wife. My favorite person, my best friend. I'll get there, actually. God told me you're my husband. And because she's this pure girl who loves Jesus and loved God so much, and her walk was way better than mine, so I thought at that point, I was thinking, you know, Matthew 5, verse 6, Jesus said that the pure in heart see God, and she's pure. Maybe she sees God, and she sees what he's saying. Maybe I'm way off, and I have no idea, and this is, this is God's match for me, you know, not that attractive. <laughs> to me, to me. She's engaged now. Shouldn't have said that. So it caused me, though, to pick my net back up because I'm not that attracted to her, but I'm going, okay, you know, if God said it. And so I'm listening to her instead of going to God, going, God, is she my wife? I went to her and went, all right, you said God. Well, I mean, I'm not, I don't know, but I'll, I'll, I'll pick a string of my net back up. And I, and I went home from where I was and, and I let some weeks go by and we, we all went separate ways and she's, she's calling me. Like five times a week, I'm picking up like once a week. I'm like, hey. You know, because I just liked that she liked me. I, it was like a safety line. 
what if nobody else loves me? What if nobody else likes me or wants me? For real. That's where I was back into worried about taking care of myself as soon as I picked that net up. I put it down, but I, I picked it back up. And I'm going, well, maybe, maybe she likes me. And I'm, I'm back at Icon. Pastor Bob is here. He's teaching. And he's saying, I'm tuning in at this point. He goes, there's 31 flavors of women, just like Basking Robins. I'm like, like they're cold? No, but... <laughs> So, no, he, but he says you get one flavor. Men, when you choose a wife, women, when you choose a husband, you get one flavor for the rest of your life. And if you choose pistachio, that's it. You get pistachio. You can't look at vanilla. You can't look at strawberry. You can't even think about, you know, Rocky Road. (laughs) It ends badly. So, And he says, God, he said, God only hits home runs. And when he said that, he, he's taking us to the word. He's showing us in the word that we can trust him. And I'm going, man, I've made a mistake. I go home and I send an email. And there's actually another girl who was a missionary somewhere else that I also let like me. And I was really convicted that I had these two girls that I was liking that they liked me, but I didn't like them back. Come on. You guys have done that. <laughs> or you're doing it right now pray. So I sent the same email. I just put different names and sent it again. Uh, I didn't need to have another conversation. I mean, that would have made it hard on them and me. So I sent an email. They were really mad that I sent an email. But I, I just said, you know, I'm really sorry. And it was a very, it was like, it was a confession saying, here's where I was at. I like that you liked me. I was being really selfish. I really, I, I know that God's not that he's not in this, that, you're, that I'm not your husband. And I felt really weird having to say that, but I had to because I'd set it up. And, and I cut those lines. As soon as I cut those lines, there was a day of, like, of fear. Like, oh my gosh, my nets are back on the floor. Like, is God really going to take care of me? But like a weekend, I'm like, this is awesome. I don't have to worry about anybody liking me. I don't have to worry about maintaining a relationship because I had never been there before. I, I can do whatever, go wherever, do anything for Jesus Christ. And so I was stoked that I was there. And it's at that moment when I'm there, I'm now back serving with Icon. I'm not on staff yet, but I'm, I'm serving at FAU. And Pastor Billy goes, hey, um, you know, while you're serving at FAU, I, I was thinking about bringing on Kate Lederstorff. Do you know who that is? I'm like, I have no idea. You know, I don't know. Really? She goes to Icon. I have no idea. And the first moment that he's like, well, she, I'm bringing her on the team. He brings her in the meeting. That was the last time I paid attention to the Calvary FAU ministry. You know, for, and I was, and it was like, boom, that was it. And they say, when you know, you know. I don't know how to explain it, but when you know, you know. She didn't know. <laughs> I did. It took some, it took some convincing. But before that, I had, I had, I had just gone, God, I'll give you my dream girl. I, I, I described my dream girl to God. I gave all the points and all the, all the features, all the things she liked, all the things she didn't like. I gave my dream girl to God. Kate looked nothing like my dream girl. Kate acted nothing like my dream girl, and I'm glad because he blew my dream girl out of the water. No, for real. So, and now in that, you know, I never thought I'd be a dad. I never thought, I I saw no way that I would adopt, how could you love kids that aren't your own? You know, now we were about to adopt three children that that we're fostering right now in our home. We have a a one-year-old, Claire, who's beautiful, and we have another girl on the way, so who's due in August. God is just growing my family in ways I couldn't have thought. Ephesians 3, verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above what we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Exceedingly above and beyond what you could ever ask or think. My dream girl, he blew that out of the water. God goes, I want to do beyond what you can imagine. My, my idea when I was arrested and when I got out of jail was never go back to the east coast of Florida again. You know what God had planned? God's idea was to send me back to the east coast because he had Calvary Chapel, he had Icon, he had Calvary FAU, he had Patmos in mind to make me a fisher of men. I wouldn't have imagined that. I wouldn't have imagined what he's done with Icon and with Patmos. Now, listen carefully, and I hope, I pray this speaks to all. 
Luke 9, 23 says, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Deny yourself, pick up your cross daily and follow him. The commitment to Jesus is a daily commitment. We have to make it over and over and over. Listen, your commitment to Jesus yesterday does not determine your commitment to Jesus today. I don't care what you did last year. What did what, you do today? What is Jesus doing with you this week? What's he doing? What's he, what, where, do you, where are you going tomorrow? What are you planning? Your commitment to Jesus, for those of you who are believers, and some of us know that our today doesn't really define what it was yesterday, or vice versa. It says in 20, they immediately left their nets and followed him. Can I point something out? When we aren't following him, when we aren't following Jesus, we pick our net back up. And a, a sign that you're not following Jesus, you've picked your net back up. You've picked back up your strategy to taking care of yourself and haven't trusted him that he's going to make you. John 21, the, Peter, Peter had denied Jesus three times at this point. Peter had failed big time. And Peter says in John 21, I, you know, Jesus is dead. They haven't seen him. And he goes, guys, I'm going fishing. He just went back to what he knew. I, he, I don't know if Peter didn't feel worthy of, of, being, of being called a disciple anymore, so I'm just going back. The cool thing is Jesus shows up. And it was just the presence of God that changed Peter back. It was the presence of Jesus that caused him to jump off the boat and swim back to shore, back to Jesus. And sometimes it just takes you resetting, getting back in the word, the presence of Jesus in the word, and the presence of him at Icon when you're worshiping, the presence of him when you're around believers just will cause you to drop the net again. Now, me, I, I picked it up many times and every time regretted it. It always led back to sin. It always led, led back. My final, I think my final major net pickup ended when I went, I'm dropping everything and I'm going to Patmos. It was just, I'm selling everything I have, which was like a surfboard. And I, I went to, and I got only like 50 bucks for it, which is a ripoff. It was a good one. But I wanted to be a fisher of men and I wanted to be done with the crud. And God changed my life. So really quick, sorry, we're out of time, but that word, that word left in verse 20, that they left their nets, that word left is the Greek word aphaeme. Aphaeme. It means to forsake, to omit, to be done with, to forget. It's not, it's not a word that it's like, oh, but to leave on a shelf for later. It's a word to be done with. They were done with their, their current strategy of life, and they were going to follow Jesus, the new strategy that he would make them fishers of men. It says, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake it's that word, aphaeme. All he has cannot be my disciple. If you can't forsake everything you have, they forsook their nets and they followed Jesus. Everything you have, sinful, not sinful, whatever. <laughs> if you can't do that, you can't be a disciple of Jesus. It's, it's his words. Luke 14, 23, if you want to look it up. That word left is an action word. It's not a feeling. Oh, I feel bad. I feel like I shouldn't do this anymore. It was, it was, a, it was an action. Repentance is an action. Repentance is leaving something behind and running towards Jesus Christ. It's not bringing it with you. He'll help you lay it down, but really, you, just, you have to lay it down. He can't force it. He can't slap it out of your hands. That's not free will. So, it, the cool thing, that word left, that word aphaeme, it's also the same word. Aphaeme is also the same word that's used for forgive. Whenever you see forgiveness in the Bible, the words of Fayame. So they omitted, they forgot, they left behind their nets. And when you, when you decide to repent from that way you're living, it's your, when you leave it behind, when you Fayame it, Jesus Fayames you. When you forget and leave behind that sin, Jesus forgets and lays behind that sin. Forgets it. As far as the east is from the west, it's done. Cool thing that that word is the same. 1 John 1.9 says, 
If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we afeame, or he will afeame us. He will forgive us. He will forget the sin. We just have to give it to him. We have to leave it behind. We have to forget it. Some of you in this room have picked your nets back up. Some of you in this room have given your life to Jesus, but over and over you run back to your nets because you don't trust him to provide. You don't trust him to satisfy. And he, he so wants to. But he can't slap it out of your hand. It's an action. You have to repent. You have to confess it. You have to give it to him and leave it behind. And he'll leave it behind, man. He is faithful and just to forgive you. So I can assure you, many past relationships. When I, when I was engaged to Kate, I was scared to death about the honeymoon. I was by no means a virgin, far from it. But I believed that God had forgiven me. And no lie, that first night on the honeymoon, she gave me permission to tell you guys this. That first night on the honeymoon, I swear to you, was like the first time ever. That all to say, redemption of Jesus Christ is not 99.999%. It's 100%. It's 200%. It's forever percent. <laughs> Whatever that is, infinity percent. <laughs> Those who have given yourself away, he fully wants to redeem it. And he will. He promises. So, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Old things are done. They're done. You are a brand new creation in Jesus Christ if you're a believer. And that's a daily truth. As you pick up your cross daily, deny yourself daily and follow him, you are daily a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen? Own it. Let's pray. Father, come to you in Jesus' name. And Lord, thank you for your word and thank you that it penetrates. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your holiness. Thank you for the cross. Thank you, Jesus, that you paid a price we never could. And then you come into us and you do a work we could never do by making us disciples and making us into your image. And then we get heaven and, and you reward us for what you did for us and did through us you're in a, you are the god worth serving you are the master worth following jesus we want to be like you we want to love like you we want to disciple like you so lord will you help us to follow you and will you make us into fishers of men lord forgive us for our, our tendency to make Christianity a self-help thing and that it's all about fixing ourselves. Lord, we confess that the work you have done on the cross is once and forever, that we are redeemed and there's nothing else we can do but accept it. So Lord, would you just make us efficient here to be disciple makers, to be contagious disciples for you, Jesus.